And, and we'll, we'll, well, that's exactly what we're going to discuss now, the rest of the talk. What can we realize that what would the experiment be? Um, next slide. OK, so properties of a charged clock. If there is a rest frame in the fifth dimension, then there should be time dilation or time contraction. We're not sure which way the sign is of a charge clock. This would be an effect unknown to physics and never probed. So totally new thing. No one's ever looked for it. No one's ever thought about it. If any of you experimentalists could find it, you could be the next Millikan or you know Rutherford or something. So it'd be a big discovery. Next slide. Um, the clock must be uniformly charged. Uh, at first, when I, when I started on this, I've been wrestling with the concept of a charge clock for like five or six years. When I first started, I had the naive idea that I would you know, take something charged and put a clock inside, and there'd be charge on the, you know, it'd be a charged clock. But it's not the right charged clock. Because, I don't know, if you, if you think about it spatially, uh, this is the edges, let's say. I, let's say I cut a slice through the water bottle. Um, this is charge. I put a charge on the surface. I have a clock on the inside. But there's no charge here. This isn't moving. So you need a uniformly charged body to test this. It's got to be charged through and through. And of course, we know charge is point particles. So what is the smearing? You know, uh, is it only for the point? Or is, it, is there like some averaging effect to the time dilation? Anyway, has to be uniformly charged. That's the trick. How do you come up with a uniformly charged clock? Uh, next slide. I think volume charges would be difficult to realize. But surface charges are easy. So if we could, if someone can think of a two-dimensional clock, it would be easy to charge it. You put it on the surface of a sphere and charge it up. So Rockwell fermions. Uh, uh, could you, um, since you're using epsilon zero, couldn't you uh, shift the epsilon or, or re? Uh, I, want, I don't want to use renormalize, but um, uh, never mind. <laughs> okay, that's fine. So, I this is where I wanted to ask the experimentalists. You know, is it can we find a two-dimensional clock? Can we charge a three-dimensional clock uniformly? Yes. Aren't capacitors, since they leak a little bit, aren't they a clock of sorts? Well, the inside's not charged inside the sandwich, is it? The charge is on the... So when you say a capacitor, I, the plates are charged. You know, you know what I mean? The, yep, I got yeah, you. So. You know, that was an LC okay. oscillator. Yeah. An LC oscillator. is charged uh, oscillator. Well, that's a circuit, right? It's a, it's a relation between the current and the voltage and the capacitance and the inductance. You just need something that has like an event associated. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Uh, that's why I, I'm good. Yeah, keep, you, keep you, it throwing. You need something that just has like an event of known time, right? It doesn't. I mean, something that you can repeatably get some sort of event, right? And so, I mean, even like an an eddy current on a charged plate or something like that that takes time to dissipate. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know if that makes any sense. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. what, about, uh, what about uh, electrics? Electrics. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. Yes. Electrics. In fact, I had to Google it when Martin was talking about it. Yeah. What the hell's an electric? Yeah. Now I get it, yeah. Are you familiar with Earl Sachs's electrified pendulum from 1964? Oh, yeah. Someone else suggested, was that Nembo, a pendulum? Uh, no, I'm not familiar. Uh, he, he found some strange time effects, which could be like a time dilation, uh, with his electrified gizmo. Huh. Uh, it's in Nature, 1964, June. But anyway, it's somewhere in that ballpark. What was the name? 
Uh, Earl Saxel, S-A-X-L. S-A-X-L, okay. Yeah, I'll be glad to take a look at it. Before you check on that, uh, that experiment has been repeated and it was found out that it was an electrostatic interaction <coughs> between the walls. Well, uh, okay. Well, so, <laughs> yeah, charge of watching the top. <laughs> okay. But, but, you you but even, <laughs> say, but even if uh, that effect has been satisfied, it still might serve your purpose. Yeah, when Nembo suggested it, I th you think, well, is the, is the arm charged? I, I'm not sure. I have to think it through. Um, Tony? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know if this would be right, but isn't some, a, a mass that is charged, that the charge change with time in a three dimensional clock? We're, yeah, we're making it assumption that charges are varying. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, the, the other aspect of this is you need two states to measure time dilation because we like we have our muon coming through the atmosphere and we have our muon on the lab bench. We can compare. We need to do a comparison. So we not, somehow need to have a charge state where it's charged and check the time and then it's uncharged or a different charge state or maybe a different mass state. So you need something where the only difference is the charge or the mass, and that, that's the trick. Like to think about a nucleon, if you change the charge, it's a different nucleon, uh, so, or nuclide, I'm sorry, different nuclide. Um, okay, I'm gonna do Michelle, Martin, and John, okay. Michelle. I think you could probably do a double slit, a double, double slit, couldn't you? Um, they're actually taking buckyballs and charging buckyballs and shooting through the slits. Can you use, set up two identical slit experiments, one charged, one not? But what's the clock? The time to go from the emitter to the detector. Hmm. You know, I, I would like to, I'm just going to start tabulating these. So we, we had the pendulum. Um, the double slit. Uh, you can then, also use an electron. The nuclide. An electron? Sure. How would you change its state? How do you, would you get the undilated or uncontracted time? Well, you can add energy into an electron, can't you? But it's just charged to mass. That's all we have to work with. So that's why I was thinking originally you could use the, like, the buckyballs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what's the clock on a buckyball? The time to go from oh. point A to point B. Hmm. Okay, I'll have to think about it. And who, what else was suggested? If I Eddy think? current. Eddy current. Electrodes. Oh, electrodes. That well, yeah, that was it. Okay. Okay. Uh, I want to come back to the capacitor because you could use just one plate. The capacitor has two plates, but. One plate would, could be your two-dimensional surface, since it's, yeah. the charge would be degrading right. at a certain rate. That's a clock, and use, use your one plate. You mean the clock is the discharge time? Or? The plate, yes, the clock is the discharge time, okay. and you only need to measure that on one side. Okay. And, that's, and you said you wanted two dimensions. Yes. Okay, uh, Martin. Yep, um, I think, um, well, if you, if you think about a classical clock, right, something which is just oscillating, whatever, then you have a big problem if it's being charged up that you have uh, radiation and whatever, okay? So um, you, you, must have, um, you must have a linear motion with no acceleration, it would be the best. And how I would approach this is a time of flight uh, uh, mass spectrometer, kind of. That you have, uh, well, you, 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 you take a particle, right? And uh, you, um, um, you, you, you go from one gate to the second gate. You can make very accurate uh, time measurements. And you can take uh, uh, um, ions, which are, uh, uh, which are in a different charge state. It can be single charge, double charge, whatever. And so you vary the charge mass ratio you have the same ion gun, you can just select the different particles, you can do very high resolution, you can see if the time of light is changing in a linear way, no radiation value. That's the cleanest thing that you can do. 
Yeah, I still, moving through space, uh, uh, the, the, the motion through, the time it takes to go through space is the clock, is that what you're saying? Right. That's what Michelle was saying. I, I, I just have to wrap my head around, I'm not sure, but. So that's I, not time for you? Not really. I mean, is it a charged clock to have charge moving in space and time how long it takes it to go? Because you set the muon, right? It's going and it's yeah. there, and because there is time dilatation, it but, goes much further. Yeah, but there its beta is from the motion. Now our beta is from the charge. But you said it's the same thing, right? It's time dilatation. Same yes, thing. it is, but it's so, motion in the fifth dimension. Right. So, uh, so it just means that if it's charged, that it has to make an extra loop in the fifth dimension, right? So, so it should take more time. Hmm. It, it's, it's, it should reflect in the, in the decay rate because it would take longer because of some sort of dilation <coughs> effect to it. Yeah, I don't know. I, you, you probably are seeing it more clearly. I, just, I have to go sit in the corner and really think about it. But, uh, but thank you. That's good. Uh, Tony? If you had uh, a, a mass that could, uh, you could easily knock electrons off the laser, you could have two of them. One, you're knocking electrons off the laser, and the other, you're not. So one's getting charged, or the other one's not being charged. The charge is changing over time. And if you know the laser frequency, you should be able to the time. How many electrons per? But are you assuming a 2D clock, or you've already got it, the volume charge? I'm just throwing something out here. I oh. don't know what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so it's got to be, yeah, we need the clock in there, and it has to be charged, and then we have to have two states. Well, move, move both of them with, with time. Accelerate the frame, both frames at the same time, and then acceleration gives you time. Hmm. Okay. What, what, what do you call that, Tony? I'll add it to the list. That's something out of my head. Uh, <laughs> what, what is it? Is it different than the time of flight mass spectrometer? clock or something, yeah. Hmm. Well, I'll put laser clock as a placeholder, but we may have to drill in. A laser mass clock or something. Yeah. Bill? Go ahead, Bill. Oh, um, it's my pet. It's a rotating wave. Um, it's ionized. So when it rotates, yeah, it's, it's it, it creates a field. Mm -hmm. It's got a field already, so that's the charge. And when it's put in motion, it dilates, etc. You could use. Um, it's a model. Total angular momentum. The only way to measure time is with motion. Yeah. So, what are looking for? Yeah, I was thinking something yeah. similar. Like but quantum state possible. switching? Yes. You recite and then it comes back. But how total angular momentum. Just to go back though, what, what do you mean by a rotating wave? I know it's your thing, Bill, but what is the wave? What's, what's the wave? Um, what's the wave? It's, it's a half a. Half a photon, I believe, um, and it's brought into rotation, and it, it creates a you know a central electric field. It radiates out, and as it rotates, the electric field creates a magnetic field. Magnetic field induces the electric field, has a north and a south, and when it's put in motion, what's the it though? It's a rotating wave. <coughs> That's, uh, I mean, that's the best I can do. Just an EM wave with the... Yeah, electromagnetic rotating wave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think I see what he's talking about. <laughs> but, 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 but it's very true. Like, like, like you had the best point. If you, have, if you talk about decay, right? Decay is something very internal process, right? right. It's a, not, not so much motion, but it's critical to time. So like what about on. charging up, charging up uh, something that that is radioactive, right. and you see if the if the decay rate is changing. Yeah. Well, that's that's very internal time. Yeah, that's why I I might put that in the nuclide category. Is that what you mean? Like a yeah, you you yeah. you charge up something which is radioactive, and you see if there's a change in decay rate. That's the most. Oh, oh, you're saying a macroscopic like yeah. a lump of uranium. Yeah. You measure the decay rate, and, and, and if you charge it up, I like that. Yeah. That's yeah. that's very direct. Way. Yeah, that seems. Uh, what should we call that? Uh, like, and if it doesn't change, that's your. Yeah, it's lifetime. It's, it's lifetime. Life I'll easy. call it charge yeah. uranium. And you can do this very well. You can do this on on. <coughs> Element well on, on, on atomic yeah. particles. But if you charge it, how do you get it like an electret? So would it be in a uranium electret or something? Uh, no, you, you make it. Um, yeah, you ionize it. You just ionize it. 
you, you, check, you, check, you check if the decay rate of an ionized um, whatever particle is different than the non-ionized. <laughs> yeah, but you can't control the charge state. If you, you're changing, whatever makes it decay depends on its charge state, presumably, so we need to disentangle that. Radioactive decay then depends on... I mean, what's the standard for the second, right? The standard for the second is based on the season at the KM. Yeah, so, okay, well, just, uh, so what are you saying? I heard someone say, take a lump of uranium, charge it up. So where are the charges on the outside? That, that's one way to do it. But that's not, it, if it's a 3D object, it has to be volume. Right, charge. but that's why I said you, um, you take a little uh, atom and you ionize it. Huh? Then, then you have, let's say you, you make a plasma. So you take a cesium plasma. Yeah, you, you take a cesium plasma, then you have 3D charges all strip inside. Out, strip out the and, and you check if, if this plasma has, has a different decay rates than the plasma. Okay. That's, that's yeah. 3D charge yeah. and everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's the most yeah. best thing you can do. Okay. Lance. Yes. Yes. Uh, and then, uh, then we'll go to Tony. Uh, uh, the problem here is what you have this ionization, you are not changing really the charge, you are moving an atom somewhere else. You know, the charge of the nuclei remains the same. Isn't it? Yeah, that's where the UPK comes from. Yeah, I see what Nembo's saying. Yeah, yeah. I, but it's, it's connected to what you, you were saying before. We, we have to, to think about uh, uh, charged, charged particles or. Uh, a uh, system of particles, because in the case we have a system of particles where they're moving uh, uh, charges around. We are not uh, basically yeah, well, changing the charge. Yeah, of I, I take your point. Uh, 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 elementary charge of the nuclei, of the proton and of the electron stays the same. <laughs> okay. It's just moving uh, yeah, charge. I, charge. I, I understand, yes. Uh, so, thank you. Tony? Uh, if you use a laser to knock the charge off your radioactive material, then it's the same thing I just said. Yeah, but it's going to be on the outside. That's the thing. You need to, if it's 3D object, it has to be volume charge. I don't know how you would charge a 3D object. Yeah, because even that plasma is going to be a neutrally charged plasma. No, plasma doesn't have to be neutrally charged. And furthermore, if you made a 2D vapor deposition layer, then it's a single atom pole. If you're worried about surface charges, but plasmas can be have carry charge internally. I mean, that's how an ion cluster works. You dump an ionized plasma and neutralize it on the outside. Okay, that, that's a good list. Uh, let's go on. I got a few more considerations here, and then, but we're getting close to the end, uh, at least uh, what I have. Okay, if there is no rest frame. It's the other option where we don't really know if there is a rest frame in the fifth dimension. If there is no rest frame, I think this is actually the best case. Uh, the other one is nice for a nice experiment to prove something that's not predicted in the existing theory. But if there is no rest frame in the fifth dimension, then the time coordinate is bound up with the fifth coordinate. And perhaps what we've called the time coordinate all along for charged particles had this extra piece. So, uh, so we sort of have uh, C delta T uh, plus our delta X5 that, are, that is constant or has uh, sort of sets the rest mass, if you will. And as you see in that quick study where I, I talk about the time distance problem, the limit, the limit, the time distance problem comes because the time coordinate has a factor C with it. So to make a nice four vector, you have to have the speed of light. And this is what sets the limit. It, you know, at the constant that multiplies the time coordinate, that's what sets the limit to the time distance problem. If we now are adding a piece here, X5, which, which also has no rest frame, maybe charged particles have a different limiting speed. But I'm not sure we would ever would have known until now. Um, but this is, that's just my thought on that. So 
That's why I say implications for the time distance problem if the fifth coordinate has no rest frame, if it's like time, you know. Um, so, Tony? If you're concerned about something that's charged and uh, you want to change its mass somehow, in an electron moving to a magnet, moving a curvature orbit in the magnetic field to release a photon, so mass changes. Uh, you mean truck and Bremsstrahlen? Yeah, Bremsstrahlen. But the electron keeps its same mass. It's the acceleration that launches the photon. I think they keep the same mass if it lost mass. Photon mass. Uh, it's it's from the the energy that's a, that's bending it. So it so it, from the field. So, it, so it gains a photon from the energy of the field. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So next slide. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to summarize the breakthrough potential of the whole theory. Uh, an electromagnetically tunable coupling of mass to gravity. That's nice. This is different than the whole Mach effect thing. The Mach effect, uh, you got an extra piece. And, you know, you got the Newtonian equation plus junk. And I'm going <laughs> to oscillate the junk and try and counteract the rest of it. This is a different approach. This says, I've just got my typical equation, but I'm gonna turn the knob and turn down the force of gravity or turn it up or control it. So it's a very different mechanism. Wouldn't you say, Jim? Oh, what are you turning? Is that scalar field? Scalar field. And sources, which are? It's electric charge and mass. Sources of the scale of the field that we're talking about. Yeah, we look. It's uh, it was an algebraic equation that depended on that. Yeah. But algebra is not the source of anything except algebra and thought. No, I mean, it, you you got a system, a couple of equations. One thing depends on one, and it's in somewhere else. You solve for one, plug it in. I mean, yeah. it's math, not physics. Well, <laughs> we'll, uh, I'll go, we'll just go back to the field equations. We'll go back to the field equations uh, in just a moment. Why don't write down the source? Uh, we'll go, let's uh, put Jim's comment on hold, and I'll finish this summary, and then we'll go back and look at those field equations. Okay, so electrically tunable coupling of mass to gravity. Next slide. A hyperspace dimension with very large characteristic speeds. Like C squared. Huh? Like C squared. Well, it's 10 to the 20 C. 10 to the 20. What about using that for, for oh, I'm sorry, for an electron. Yeah, maybe if we build a spaceship, it's not 10 to the 20. It's something else. So. Uh, what about using this for communication? Yeah. I never thought about that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's worth writing down. I'll write this one. Communication. I, I never thought about that. Okay. You gotta have your subspace radio. Yeah, <laughs> that, you gotta call Starfleet. That's right. That's what to do about these Klingons in the center of the galaxy or something. Yeah. Okay. Next. Uh, uh, electromagnetic control of the flow of time if the fifth dimension has a rest frame. And next slide, uh, a way to rescale the time distance problem if the fifth dimension is time-like. I, I meant to say if the fifth dimension has no rest frame. That's what I mean by time-like. So I think the theory has a lot of potential. Um, and I, I had a couple more, uh, and then we'll go back to the field equations. So next slide. Uh, yeah, so uh, the experimental search for a charge clock can verify or falsify the Kaluza theory. As far as I know, this is a first prediction that would verify or falsify. So far, it was just another viewpoint. Um, and also determine whether the fifth dimension has a rest frame or not, potentially. Next slide. Okay, I, for backup, I want to digress to time dilation of charge clocks in existing physics. I only have two slides. So next slide, and uh, Martin already showed it. The Reisner-Nordstrom metric. I've just pulled out the time piece 
but if you have, this is the metric for a charged mass. So this is sort of the, uh, this is our gravitational time dilation. It has mass M and charge Q. There's a gravitational time dilation, and then there is an electromagnetic time contraction. They got different signs. So uh, they're working at different purposes, but here we see it's not totally alien to existing physics to think about charged clocks or the flow of time depending on electric charge. But this, uh, this Reisner-Nordstrom solution, as, as I talked with Martin, it's, it's only on the outside. So there's a mass with an electric field, mass and charge. This is the solution outside. If you go to the inner interior solution, you actually get a different dependence. So pay close attention. Here, there's an effective mass that is sort of like Q squared. And the G is multiplying the Q. Now, next slide. This is the uh, Arnowitz Deezer Misner 1960 interior solution. They have a very simple uh, relationship where they say the total energy, mc squared, is the rest energy, the electrostatic potential energy, and the gravitational potential energy. Take the limit as delta goes to zero, and you get a finite mass, and now mass is proportional to q over root g. This is the dependence that uh, we get in the Kaluza theory. It's not the Reisner-Nordstrom dependence. It's this interior solution. So existing physics has this scaling, um, but no particle obeys this law. So it was just, it's a classical curiosity. I don't think it ever went anywhere with ADM. But still, we see how this scaling comes about. So, so I'm saying, so there's reason to believe that charge mass and time are related in existing physics, uh, but the Kaluza sort of makes it explicit. In order to see, uh, if we can see the effect experimentally, you can calculate what, what should be the time dilation effect, right? Correct. So, uh, and, and how much is it for a typical particle? So For a what? For a typical particle, like, I don't know. Yeah, well, can, yeah. yeah, if it's an electron and it's like one plus beta squared and beta is 10 to the 20, you know, it could be very large. So, it, but it depends on the charge to mass ratio. Uh, the, 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 fun, the elementary particles have a very large value of charge to mass. More terrestrial things are, uh, obviously uh, go down from that. So there's really a whole range of beta values. Whereas in normal spatial betas are limited to one, you know, never get past one. In this case, they go up to astronomical numbers. Did I answer that? Mm. But if it's astronomically high, then this means, I mean, uh, that must be an effect right now, right? I mean, the electron should have a huge time dilation component, right? That, that we don't see. Well, yes. We? Yeah, and that's, yes. Uh, Especially what I was talking, uh, like effectively changing the the effective time of it, but but doesn't yes. it somehow exclude it somehow? Right? I mean, if you for the electron, the effect should be enormously high, and 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 we don't. Uh... You need something to compare it, don't you? Like, what would you compare it to to tell? It was saying that if you are varying the, the charge to mass ratio, then you can see the variation in the time dilation. Right, right. You see the variation, the time dilation. Mm. So it's big, it will get bigger or smaller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it could be, that's what I'm saying, but you need something to compare. You know. Right, but okay, if it's so huge for the electron, I mean, it should be also very, very large still. That's what I'm saying on the particle level. Let's say on the hydrogen. hydrogen, whatever. I can easily charge up hydrogen, right? So, and so far, I mean, this effect must be the seal, was enormous. Well, what's the, is a hydrogen, hydrogen atom neutral? Um, is it if it's charged, no, because it's just a proton. And if it's deuterium or tritium, then it's... Well, but I think my point is, yeah, you got the little thing in the center with plus and the thing on the outside or the wave on the outside. 
with some distributed smear of negative charge. Uh, so I'm not sure how to you know, pose the question to say, oh, it's ruled out by observation, because I'm not sure what to compare it to. Yeah, but we could never, we can never, on the electron level, change its charge level, right? So if, if we could change the charge of the electron, then we can find this effect, right? But we can't. Right. What's the so, so, but how, how else can we then test it? We, we do uh, stuff. That's what all this stuff is. <laughs> yeah, but, but it depends, right? If yeah. it's, uh, depending on the charge of the single particle or of the charge, so I can have this, uh, electrons electrons from an atom. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, depends on which level this is this object is working. If it's on the elementary That's particle, what I'm saying. How much is the composition of elementary? So so if, if it's already ten to the twenty one for an electron, for sure it's ten to the ten or whatever for 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 an atom, right? But then, then we should have seen this but what what happens when you put the photon in the smithy electron? Say, uh, why don't you think about how we do the Think about the atoms that ionize in swarms, so you can take an atom and ionize it, and then ionize it some more. So then you've got two states, you've got a charged state and an extra charged state. So you could do that. And there, are, there are atom fountains, there's atom interferometry, there's all kinds of things you can do that with time of lines. Um, by the way, the, the number I gave you, that 2 times 10 to the 30, that was for the velocity, not the not the uh, Q over M. Q over M for an electron is, is 10 to the 21, but the velocity, that velocity in the fifth dimension, that was like 2 times 10 to the 30. Uh, that, that velocity was what I was talking about, not the curie Um Okay, so uh, I was going to go back to the field equations. Uh, okay. You know, you're a fire in my head, and I remember something. But I remember reading a paper, and I couldn't tell you who did it, but uh, somebody proposed that time within a charged uh, sphere moves different than outside a charged sphere. The rate of time. Somebody, did somebody remember reading anything about that? Yeah. They were, play, they were playing they were with the um, permittivity. It's, uh, it's a very, are you talking about the rate of speed of light? I think it would be as well to do with the radiation reactions. Uh, very small times, that pre scale of time, 10 to the minus 23. So they say that the, the, light go, the light of the photon goes across the width of the photon faster than the speed of light, and that takes into account that pre acceleration time. But it's a very, very, very short time. So that's, that's what I think you're talking about. Well, I was wondering how it would relate to this. No. Okay, Jim, uh, we got the field equations back up here. Well, I'm thinking it's very simple. You could write down gravity, write down field and source, but field, gravity, source, mass, field, electromagnetism, source, electric charge. Okay, field, scalar field, what is the source? Right here. I can't see. Oh, it. it's, uh, it's just. It's the ratio of the scalar curvature to the uh, contracted field strength tensor. So you're telling me that it's a geometrical source. Is that what you mean by, when I say algebraic, you mean geometric? You say the phi is a scalar field. What is the source of the field? This is the field equation for the scalar field I maintain. That's what yes, I'm saying. The these equations may involve the source, but I want to know is what is the source? Okay. Uh, there's a particle at all. Yeah. Is there so, a particle as an electrically charged sources? Yeah. You're not, you're saying, what is the particle? Fields, fields have sources. Usually. Yes. Usually. <laughs> okay, what's the source? Leave out Wheeler's magnetic geons. Please. Um, you know, this might be a, a point. As I said, Kaluza actually wrote down the, 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 the uh, stress tensor. And you see it's missing from the Maxwell equations. There should be a current here. Um, so if you just write down sort of a naive uh, stress tensor like this, so it's, it's what we might expect for dust, which is a very simple one. Uh, then you actually get, there's gonna be uh, terms like this, and that is current. 
because we have charge times velocity, okay? And then the regular, just the space-time pieces are, look like this, more or less. That's the typical four-dimensional dust in this simple model. But there's going to be a piece like this, U5 squared. And that's going to be a source term here. If I add, if I add in the stress tensor, so I, I add the matter stress tensor here, I add the current here, and I get that thing here. These are vacuum equations. So I've thought about what is this thing, what does this thing mean? I don't know. I'm not sure. So, so oops, one more question. Um, arrow of time. Is that can that be determined in the set of equations? Arrow of time. I don't think so. Uh, like all the derivatives are second order for one thing. Um, so I don't think so. But no. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, was, when you when you take a uh, photon and energize the hydrogen from the N1 to the N2 state, right? So you've added this energy, right? Mm -hmm. What about the time that it takes for that to come out? That's a, a fixed time, right? For most experiments. Mm -hmm. Right? So, I mean... <coughs> you change the mass. Yeah, changing the mass, changing the time, I don't know. I'm just seeing if that has anything to do with yeah. To, would, would that be a way to the effective to, mass because it's got a little kick of energy in there? Uh, yeah, right, right. Would that be a way to test experimentally? This? Maybe. Yeah, I would. So we could call that an excited atom. Right, excited Maybe. atom, because we know it, the time of decay is pretty well known, right? Yeah. And and yet, if you're looking at it from this standpoint, that you've proposed it's just a totally different paradigm of looking at. Okay, so now we've changed the mass. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, but wouldn't it be weird if it reproduces all this, but then this part doesn't work? Maybe, maybe that's just the way nature is, a bit of a trickster or something, but it seems to me when everything else works uh, and that we never quantized gravity, it tells me the fifth dimension is real and macroscopic. Uh, I mean, why not? I, I, wouldn't, I can't eliminate that so far, and so... I think this is really promising. And, and, and I, I focused on, it's really not building a warp drive. I didn't say, oh, I'm gonna, you know, I didn't show you my design for a warp drive based on some cockamamie theory. I said, here's a theory with a lot of potential. Let's prove if, is it a correct or not? What's the simplest way? And if we, if someone did an experiment like this, it would revolutionize physics and then this would be wide open and people could start working. Uh, so that, that's, you know, instead of trying to design something myself, I want to see, this is the right type of theory. Can it be correct, if it is correct? So that, that's my focus. Uh, Todd. Yeah, um, in my quantum gravity model, I get gravity essentially from a scalar field which is comprised of the electromagnetic zero point field plus all the interactions with other particles in the universe that act as uh, dissipations or power dissipation. Um, so in that sense, there may be some connection between your scalar field here and the scalar field in my model for quantum gravity. That might relate the two as that scalar field is the electromagnetic field um, in, a, in sort of a randomized system. And uh, the, the dissipation factor, it, it's a balance between uh, the driving force, the driving field, and the dissipated field. And then when that symmetry is broken, we get gravity. So there may be some connection. And I, I searched, uh, I spent some time trying to tie it to dark matter, dark energy. Um, for all we know, those are scalar fields. Uh, it, it's related there too. Yeah, it's, so... But yeah, the question is still, as it was in 1919, what is the scalar field? How does it fit? Um, and it's probably out there somewhere, if this theory is correct, but 
but I see it, the practical aspect is it, it couples gravity and electromagnetism. You know, so with this type of thing. So, so let's just say there is no rest mass and it's more or less coupled to time. What would that phi be then? Would it be one or zero? Uh, I, it, it wouldn't change it. it the, uh, that, its value doesn't depend on whether or not there's a rest frame. Um, I don't think. Um, but there's also, it also implies if we take, you know, the, the standard uh, gravitational metric, it has a so-called Minkowski limit where it's just diagonal and we do special relativity. Then there should be that fifth component again. So there should be a special relativity uh, as well with that fifth dimension. I mean, it's, stands to reason, maybe there's a reason, you know, that it, it doesn't work out, but again, it's very suggestive, the pull is in that direction. Uh, Bill. Just going back to my own ideas, but if uh, that fifth dimension, the magnitude of it, zero, then you do just got special theory of relativity, you've got some condition, you don't have intrinsic curvature, you just got an electron going forward. But I'd have to explain it in detail. Mm -hmm. okay. So, that's my big idea. <laughs> <laughs>